Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, how do we get right into it? Uh, tonight I'm going to talk about repentance. Uh, this is one of the first behaviors that we teach our children how to get along with others. How to get along with others and how to not offend them or uh, just do bad. So we teach them to say, I'm sorry. Sometimes they don't even mean it, but we want them to take, the, take on that behavior of not offending. And uh, that is so important as being saved. Uh, not to uh, get God upset with us for what we do, uh, for trespasses. Uh, if you can repent, God is like, there's so many times in the Bible where things were going to happen that was destruction where it changed because the people repent. And that's one of the things that will stop even us being saved right now. We're looking at, we're born in sin shaped in iniquity. We're heading to hell. But if we can repent, which is the first, by the way, the first uh, step in the uh, six principles of the doctrine is to repent. If you can repent, then, and also believe that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you can believe that, then you're on your way yeah. because everything else just follows. Even uh, seeking the Holy Ghost, when you're at the altar, uh, if you can repent, and believe that God is a, a, a rewarder, then you'll get it. You'll get it. I, I, I witnessed someone on my job. Uh, I was on the same line. Years, this is years ago where I worked at ER Carpenter. And uh, I moved up to another department for forgot about uh, the individual, I used to give them a ride home and pick them up sometimes for work. And time had gone by, and I think I was just passing through, and he came up to me and he said, Richard, I had a dream. I dreamed that if I go to your church, that everything's gonna be all right. And you don't know how many times where I've gotten where people have said, I want to come. I'm coming. And like my dad used to say, they'll tell you they're coming Sunday and 20 years go by and they still haven't came. Uh, but this is your visual was different. He told me, I mean, he told me to pick him up and I did. I was very shocked when he came out because I've had people to say, come pick me up and you get there and you know they're there, <laughs> but they ain't coming out. <laughs> Uh, but he came out, and he was still holding on to that dream. And he came in, and when the altar call was made, he went up there and got baptized. And uh, Elder Pompey, the older Elder Pompey, baptized him. And when he came up, he was speaking in tongues. Wow. And Elder Pompey said he could feel him shaking. In the water, he could feel something trembling. That's if someone is repentant, and he was already expecting something. He was already expecting deliverance for where uh, he was going through, and that's what he believed, and that's what happened. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is, uh, if we are, that's for those that are not saved. Seeking the Holy Ghost is easy. I didn't know how easy it was 
when I was tarrying, because I tarried for three weeks. And it wasn't like no hit and miss, or it wasn't like uh, when services, after services. No, we tarried every day. And we tarried for a while, long, long time. But all that sweating and crying and all that stuff doesn't really, you don't uh, have to do that. It doesn't take that. Uh, what it takes is what we can't see as an individual, and that's the heart. That's, right. that's the mind. Only God can see that. Only God knows I'm truly repentant. Right. I'm truly forsaken. I'm not going to go back to this. Let's, I don't need to define the word de, uh, repentance. Repentance means to turn away. Uh, if you're going one direction, it's to turn and go the opposite. And in this case, we're talking about spiritual. So it's like walking this way, which is my own way. And hearing the word of God, and it does something to me. And I want to be right with God, so I change. And I allow God to direct my life. Uh, we have many, many examples of repentance in the Bible because that's all through the Bible. Because that's, like I said, that's, uh, no, I didn't say, but it is the key to salvation in any dispensation. It's the first step, repentance. And it's, it's the key in every dis any dispensation you can go to in the Bible, repentance is there. Uh, and we're going to go to uh, the first family, which was uh, in the uh, Genesis 4. And... Uh, Four and six verse. And because of time, I'm just going to, I'm going to give you the story, but I'm going to read where, uh, in this case, God is asking Cain to repent. Uh, let's go to four. Okay, let me go to four. Uh, four and six. And, and the Lord said unto Cain, Why is thou wroth? Wroth means angry. And why is thy consciousness fallen? If thou dost, doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. So I'm going to stop at right there. Here is an example of a man not repenting. And God is telling him, you, you see the concern here with God. He's asking, asking the man, why are you mad? Well, I'm going to go back, back, back a little bit. Uh, when the fall of man, uh, Adam taught his kids how to sacrifice, to make sacrifices for the Lord. So, Cain knew what to bring, and so did Abel. Abel brought the first of his flock, uh, uh, flock and Cain brought uh, the, uh, the, uh, the earth, uh, like grain, stuff like that. And God had respect for Abel's offering, but didn't have respect for Cain. So here he is, he's pleading with uh, Cain, and he says, now he's already done wrong. He's already done the wrong. That's, that's not taken away, but he's saying, if you do right, you'll be accepted. So therefore, there's, a, there's the first case of, uh, of, of you seeing repentance. You can repent and get back in good grace with God. Right. And uh, that didn't happen there. And because of it, like God told him, sin life at the door and sin, he became a murderer and didn't do well. 
Uh, the next case was uh, Job. Uh, let's go to Job 42. And we know about Job. Job, uh, at the beginning, he was a blessed man, had all the riches, and God was uh, having a conversation with the devil. Have you considered him? Have you considered Job? Uh, he's uh, upright and gave him all kind of accolades. Uh, but after the uh, devil attacked him, jumping ahead, uh, some things came out about Job and to where he accused God and he thought himself to be just as righteous as God. So uh, that didn't, that, uh, the Lord was mad with him because who could be as righteous as God? Who can be on that level? And uh, so God talked to him. And uh, let's go there. Let's go there to the 42nd chapter. Are y'all there? You got it. Thank you. Uh, at the first verse, Job's answers. Now, this is after God had got after him. And Job uh, then then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withheld from thee. Who is he that hideth constantly without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered that, that I understood not, things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. And I'm skipped down to the fifth verse. I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye have seen, seeth thee. Therefore I abhorred myself and repent in dust, dust and ashes. So here again, Job realized that he really messed up and that he is wrong. And something about repentance Repentance and pride just don't go together. So if you got pride, you're not going to repent. And so that's one thing you want to get rid of uh, is pride. And so Job was like, you know, and at what point he says, I'm going to put my hand. You know, words, I'm going to put my hand over my mouth because I, I just don't know what I'm talking about. And God saw that he repented. And when he did uh, not only was uh, Job able to get back in good grace with God, but he was also able to pray for his friends who had lied on God and said that, you know, uh, said things that they were misinterpreting or mis uh, they had, well, they lied. <laughs> they lied and said that God told him something and he didn't. So uh, because of repentance, because of him taking down his pride, he was able to get himself right and then also get his friends right. Uh, another good example, there's, I mean, there's so many examples of repentance. And wow, time is just eating me up. Okay, uh, the next one we're going to go to is Job. No, excuse me, we, we just came from there. <laughs> uh, we're going to go to Jonah. Now, Jonah, I have to give these stories to you. And you can, in your own time, look them up. Uh, Jonah was told to go to uh, Nineveh. But he went the opposite, and this, the scripture says that he was running away from God, the presence of God. But that was another lesson he needed to learn, that you can't run away from God. No matter where you are, uh, God knows exactly where you are. I gave you that example. Uh, uh, I gave you that example last year, and I was telling somebody, I was, I was witnessing to somebody, and I was telling them God knows where you are. And I was telling them about the preacher 
that was uh, led to go to the farm uh, that, anyway, I'll tell you. <laughs> he, uh, he was a newly called preacher, and he was going, uh, driving, and, and God led him to go to this farm. It was an old abandoned farm. And the Lord laid on his heart to preach. So he preached. And then the Lord laid on his heart to give an altar call. So he gave an altar call. And it wasn't surprising because there was nobody there. <laughs> so he left. Uh, years and years later, a uh, man comes up to him and says, you're that crazy preacher. And he's like, well, what are you talking about? He said, you preached in that barn, and I was hiding there because I had just robbed a bank, and I was hiding there. Nobody knew I was there, but that message, I turned myself in. Uh, I, I, I got baptized in Jesus' name and got filled with the Holy Ghost. It's a true story. The guy, uh, the guy that got saved, uh, that was priest to in the barn, became a preacher himself. And is a, from what I understand, is a pastor now, a bishop, and has a very large following. But that's because... Uh, that's because God knows where we are. He knows exactly where you are. You can't hide from God. But Jonah didn't know that, but he had to find that out. And so in doing that, in doing that, God had to get the preacher right so he could get the message so that a whole bunch of people could be saved. And uh, so in doing uh, uh, Jonah repented in the belly of the whale or in the belly of the fish uh, and God directed him and God had mercy on him and, and sent him forth back to where he was supposed to be going and by that there was a whole city saved a whole kingdom I mean to the point where the king said, nobody, not even your beast, not even your flocks going to eat. We're going to go down and sack off and ashes and we're going to repent and we're going to, because this was a wicked, wicked city. And we're going to, you know, and at the, if you go to, I'm going to skip over, uh, go to uh, three, uh, chapter 3 and I'm just going to skip down to the last one and it said God saw their works and that they had turned from their evil way and God repented the evil that he had said that he would do to them and he did it not so this is another case where repentance is a big uh it, it stops the judgment that is pronounced on you as far as punishment. It will stop that if you repent. Uh, and I'm going to, because of time, I'm just going to go to my last one, which was uh, Revelations. I wanted to get to the, the, the thieves on the cross because uh, that was also a good example. But instead, I'm going to go... Uh, here, and this is the uh, first church God is talking to. I'm just going to read the fifth verse, and that is, uh, Remember, therefore, from hence thou art fallen, and repent, and do thy first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove the candlestick from out of its place, except you repent. And my very last one is us. We're the church of the Laodicea. And the scriptures talk about how we're naked and blind. We think we got it all together and we don't. But God is still pleading with us. I mean, we have pastors, we have preachers, and lately they've been coming down with the word and telling us we got to come up 
you know, and a lot of times what comes over the pulpit we may not like. And, you know, people say, oh, he stepped on my toes, but they say it happily. Sometimes it ain't so happy. And, uh, but you have to do it. You have to, and I want to read this last, this uh, 19th verse. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So that's what I'm saying to you. I, uh, sorry, I got to shorten it. But that's what I'm saying to you. Whatever comes across the pulpit and you're not up to it, get up to it. Do what you got to do because really it's not worth it. Take, get off your high horse, the, take down the pride, and, and uh, repent. And then walk right. Uh, uh, amen. That's that of you. Man, we'll turn it over to uh, Brother Christian Jackson. Let's receive my heart amen. He could have kept going with that one. If you'll turn with me in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 15, I want to talk tonight about the rapture of the church. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and verse number 19. <clears throat> if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. So th this verse is important uh, to start us out here because it's important that we think about the rapture uh, as the saints of God. It's important that the rapture is on our minds um, it's particularly important for our day because it's not on our minds like it should be. And that's not my assessment of the saints. That's God's assessment of the saints. Uh, the deacon talked about uh, the ch church Laodicea and one of the things, which is the church of our time, and one of the accusations that God had against the church of Laodicea that we, was that we were miserable and why are we miserable? He said, Paul said here, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And, and if the church, in all of the seven churches, the church of Laodicea is the most miserable because the rapture is the last thing on many of the minds of the saints. Um, the saint, a lot of the preaching today, the services and people's service to God is based on what they can get from God in this life, how they can get a better job, how they can have better relationships, how they can um, excel, how they can um, be blessed and, and, and you know, w what they can get physically, you know, money, whatever the case may be, better suits, better cars, higher position on the job. That's what we've made our services about. And, you know, I don't have a problem with, with shouting. I don't have a problem with praising. We, we are given a command to praise God. Um, I, we are given a command to pray without ceasing, so I don't have a problem with prayer. Don't have a problem with fasting, amen, because if you want some strength, that's one way to get some strength in God, amen, is to deny your flesh. But we should also be focusing on the rapture, and many uh, churches, many of the saints will focus on the prayer, will focus on blessings, focus on the natural, but we're not foc we're, we, our mind isn't where it should be in relationship to the rapture. You know, maybe it's time tonight to do a self-inventory. When was the last time that I thought about the rapture? When was the last time, you, not just you thought about the word, but when was the last time I thought about it, imagined it? What does the Bible say about it? Am I going to make it? When was the last time we actually evaluated that? Um, it's, important, it's important for us to be doing that because if in this life, if, if all it is is this, you know, sacrificing and saying no to our flesh and saying no to um, the, the worldly desires, then we're the most miserable of all men. Because the sinners, they have a, they can have, a sinner can have a good, li a good life, an enjoyable life, that is. And, and if that was the end of it, that would be the end of it. And then they would have just had a good time and that's it. But... As Paul said, there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. Everybody's going to have to give an account for the deeds done in this body. Jesus said it like this, every idle word that men shall speak shall be brought into the judgment. There is going to be a time, there's an old song, I couldn't even find the lyrics, it must be so old. 
Um, I heard an old, you know how I know it's old? Because I heard an older saint mention it. <laughs> uh, amen. I'm like, don't, don't ask me which one. <laughs> and no, it wasn't Deacon Scott. <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm teasing. That was a good message. Uh, you got, the, song, the song said, you got to live forever somewhere. And how long, how long is forever? How long is eternity? One little girl said it like this. Well, eternity is every day and every day and every day and every day. It's on and on and on. And we have got to live forever somewhere. The song said something like, with either with the angels in heaven above or the demons down below, you got to live forever somewhere. And that's what the, that's what the Bible teaches. We, we are eternal beings. Now, not all of us is eternal. We were made from dust, and it, how did he say it in Genesis? And in dust, to dust thou shalt return. In the book of Ecclesiastes, it says it like this. When a man dies, it says that the body will go back to dust. If you, you, know, if you go to, down there to Prospect Hill, and you dig up some of those vaults, and you open up some of those vaults, you know, some of the ones that were down there you know, 20 years ago, what you buried isn't going to be what it looks like anymore. It's going to start looking a little bit like dust more and more over time, depending on how old that, that, that burial vault is. And so as the, but the, it takes years to happen. With the saints, we'll talk about this maybe again in a minute. It, it, during the rapture, in the rapture, the body is dissolved instantly, um, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, however, the body goes back to dust, but the Bible goes on and Ecclesiastes continues to say that the spirit goes back to God that gave it. What, what does that mean? When, when a soul, when, when life is introduced into a body, God breathes into that body. The, there's, a, there's a spark of life that comes from God. The human, a human is three parts, body, soul, and spirit. So when there's first a body, the body is just a shell of a man. See, when you look up here at me, you don't see me. You only see my house as much as you would see me if you drove by 204 East Wayne Street. Now, we're going to have to block that out of the live stream. I don't want these weird people. No. <laughs> you, you, drive, you might drive by and look, try to peek through and look and see me, but you don't see me. Just like when you look up here. Now, this might be a nice looking house. I know. But you don't see me. <laughs> who is me? Who is, the, who is the real me? That's my soul. And my soul is neither black nor white. It's neither old nor, there's no such thing as an old soul. <laughs> the, it, it, there's no age to it. There's no gender to it. It is, the Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. My soul is in it, and it is the eternal part of me. When I die, this house, it just goes back to dust. My spirit, which is the life that's in me, well, it just goes back to the bundle of life, which is God. But my soul, my soul awaits for the judgment. Some people believe that once you die, you either go to heaven or hell. Nothing could be further from the truth. Otherwise, there wouldn't be the day that Jesus talks about where uh, the dead shall hear my voice. There, there wouldn't be a day where there would be a resurrection of the dead. There would be no resurrection of the dead in that sense. It would just be you die and you go one or the other. But the scripture also says uh, that the dead know nothing. If the dead went to heaven or went to hell, they would sure know a whole lot of something, wouldn't they? But the dead know nothing. They're awaiting the resurrection, whether it be a good resurrection or a bad resurrection. That was up to whether they lived right, whether they repented, like what the, what the minister said. Um, for the saints, we are waiting for what we refer to as the rapture. The rapture is not a word that's in the Bible. Um, but the, I'm thinking about the word oneness, I don't think, is in the Bible. But it's true. The word, the, the more accurate phrase that, that we use, that we might use for the rapture is caught up. So the, the, the rapture, uh, it just refers to the catching away of God's people. When God will call, as some might say, call his people back home, where, where all of a sudden Jesus described it like this. Two will be grinding at the mill, the one taken, the other left. Two men will be lying in the bed, the one taken and the other left. And in a moment, in a twinkling, in, a, in an eye, we will be changed. We're going to go through these scriptures. And we'll be able to live in those glorified bodies in a glorified state forever and ever and ever. That moment is referred to as the rapture. There will be others that don't have to go to hell, but they don't get to go in the rapture. Um, Paul said it like this, every man in his own order. There, there are those who are beheaded during the tribulation. They'll be a part of the first resurrection. There are two preachers, Moses and Elijah, during the tribulation period. They get to go in the first 
resurrection. There are others who um, get to make it in the first resurrection, but they won't get what we get. Why? Because we'll be the bride. And there is nobody on this earth that gets as much out of me as my bride does. Amen? (laughs) There's nobody that's as close to me as my bride is. And there's nobody that gets to reap the benefits, what few there may be of being with me. There's nobody that gets to reap those as much as my wife does. And it will likewise be that way with us and God. The Bible says that that we've been made joint heirs with Christ. Everything that is mine in that house is my wife's. I could go further into that, but I'm going to get in trouble. (laughs) And not with her. Amen. Y'all know who. Anyways, so we'll we'll keep on moving along here. If you'll turn with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 4. What are we talking about here? We're talking about the rapture. When you talk about the rapture, you're also talking about the resurrection of the dead. The rapture is just one small, just one portion of the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead is broken into two parts, the first resurrection and the second resurrection. Now, you don't want to get up on the second resurrection. You want to get up on the first one. Because what did he say? Blessed and holy is he which hath part in the first resurrection. Now, in that, se- that first re- resurrection, there's actually seven orders, or what we might call seven parts. The church is part number three, and that's the, that's the rapture of the saints. This is, this, is, this is glorious. This is the best resurrection that you could get. And we'll, and we'll talk about why in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 and verse 13. And there are so many scriptures when it applies to this subject. So you'll just have to forgive me if I mention a few in passing. Um, or if I say something that throws you off, come find me afterwards and say, Brother Christian, where, where, where does the Bible say that? <laughs> I'm not saying you to be challenging, but I'll help you find the scripture that, I, that I'm referencing. Amen? In 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 and verse number 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now, what is he referring to when he says asleep? He's referring to dead what we call dead, the Bible will refer to often when it comes to the saints as asleep. There's a whole plethora of scriptures. And for those who might be taking notes or watching later, Daniel 12, verse, verse 2 and 13, Psalm 16, verses 9 and 10, Psalm 17 and 15, Acts chapter 7, verse 60, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 14, amongst and that's just a small collection that I have here. Why do I list those off now? Because some people don't believe this anymore. What the Bible says, when a man dies, when a saint dies, he goes to sleep. You don't go straight to heaven or straight to hell. You, you, if you are a saint, you go asleep. Now, why does it say asleep? Why is it using that word instead of saying dead? Well, because asleep implies a sort of hope. Okay, when Sister Dolores dies, if she died in Christ, if she died with her heart right toward God, the expectancy is, is that she gets up again. Just like when I lay my head down at night, I strap my CPAP over my bald head and close my eyes, I expect to wake up in the morning. As it is with the saints. The saints, when they die in Christ and you die right towards God, you can have a confidence that I'm just taking a little dirt nap and I'm going to get up again. That's why he says asleep, because there's an expectancy to get back up again. Job had a confidence, and he said it, Job said it like this. Though skin worms, though my skin worms destroy my flesh, yet in my flesh will I see God. What does that mean? Well, this body's going to be destroyed, but I'm going to have something else that I'm going to be in, and I'm going to be able to see God in that. And that's what it is in the rapture. How do we know that? Because he said, um, beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know. How do we know? Well, by faith, because he says it here in his word. That when we see him, when I see Jesus, I will be like him. Why? For I'll see him as he is. That ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Now, some people... um, and, and if pe- anybody wants to do it like this, I don't mean to condemn anybody, but instead of having a funeral, they'll have a celebration of life. And maybe quite possibly because they think that, well, because they were saved, I shouldn't be sorrowful. Well, he doesn't say don't be sorrowful. He said we don't sorrow like the world sorrows. The world, they don't have any hope. If you didn't live right, that's it for you. 
You know, I've been in the funeral before where he was talking, they were talking about how the man was drinking and all that kind of stuff. It's like, it, you can't turn around and say the man was a drunk and then turn around and say he was, he's going to be up in there picking flowers with Jesus or some, you know, something like that. You, you can't have both. I, like the song said, the Bible is right and somebody's wrong. <laughs> okay, you, but th- those that died outside of Christ, they don't have hope. We have hope. If I die and my soul is right, it, it, it's going it, to, you know what, at least cry for this because it's going to sting the family a little bit, all right? But guess what? I'm just sleeping. I have an expectancy to get back up, and that's what I'm living for now anyways. And then the, the fight's over for me. I won't have to say no to my flesh anymore. I won't have to turn, turn the other cheek anymore. I'm venting a little bit, and y'all don't even know it. Um, I won't have to put up with those sort of things anymore, right? Because the fight's over for, for me, and now it's just a matter of, and now here's the thing. Don't think that once you close your eyes to sleep and you're dead, you're just waiting there all dead and everything. No, the, the dead know nothing. That means they don't even know the passing of time. So for Adam, when Adam gets up in, in the rapture because salvation was imputed to him like it is to us, although he wasn't baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, the passing of time from Adam to the rapture is going to be as if he just closed his eyes and opened them and he's going to be in the rapture. Why? Because the dead know nothing. They don't even know the passing of time. So, so if, I, if I go, don't cry, like, don't cry like my unsaved loved ones might cry because they don't know any better. Y'all know better. <laughs> that sounded harsh. I didn't mean it to be harsh. Verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Um, this in Jesus thing. He also refers to it as in Christ. So we'll talk about it when we get there. Verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So what, what is he saying? The, 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 one, the ones that are alive, well, that's not going to stop God from getting the ones that are dead um, at his coming. Now, when you refer to the coming of the Lord, what, what does the coming of the Lord refer to? Well, the coming of the Lord could refer to two things. The coming of the Lord is in two parts, um, if we can say it like that. The coming of the Lord is in two parts. How so? Well, you have the coming of the Lord for his church, and then you have the coming of the Lord with his church. The coming of the Lord for his church is also referred to in the scriptures as his appearing. To those that love his appearing. He will appear to, to the church. And when we see him, we'll be like him. That's the rapture. But the coming of the Lord with his saints is what he talks about in the book of Jude. Where he says, behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon the ungodly. That's at the end of the tribulation period when he comes with us as after his church has already been raptured and will rule and reign a thousand years with him during the millennial reign as Christ himself sits on the throne and the whole world that rejected us and thought of us as nothing, guess, who, guess where they're going to have to go once a year if they want to be right? They're going to have to come to Jerusalem once a year and stand before Christ and we, his glorified church, the perfection of the beauty are going to be ruling and reigning with him for a thousand years. That's beautiful, isn't it? Um, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which shall I remain. Uh, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. We'll talk about that trump in a little bit. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. So... If we're splitting hairs here, um, the, d- those that are actually dead in Christ, they're going to get up before those that are alive and remain. Now, later in Corinthians, we'll read it's going to happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So it's really not even going to make that much of a difference. But th- those that are dead, they're going to be coming up first. And once they hit airborne, we hit airborne with them and we both meet God in the air together. And what, but what is the prerequisite? You have to be in Christ. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean just I believe? Well, not biblically. The, the Bible says, Know ye not as many of you have, as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ? If you haven't been baptized in Jesus' name, you, have, you are not in Christ. How else did he say it? By one spirit we're baptized into one body. So also, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you're not in Christ. I'll just say it like Jesus said it. Unless a man is born of the water and spirit, he cannot enter or see the kingdom of God. 
the song said the, the song said the waterway young and old repent of all your sins and the holy ghost will enter in the evening light has come it's the fact that god and christ are one if you if you if you how do, how, how did it say it in another one of the verses to get in the church triumphant you must go the waterway one 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 way to god i can come up with all of i love those songs <laughs> in verse 17 then we which are alive and remain, so now here, it's all, and it's all in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, shall be what? Caught up out of these bodies. In one place it, sa- it says it like this. If, our, if the uh, tabernacle of our earthen vessel be dissolved. Now what does that mean? That means just like those that die and theirs goes back to dust, ours is going to go back to dust in the rapture too. When the rapture happens, those that are alive, you're not going to be able to look around and see a bunch of dead bodies laying everywhere. It's dissolved just like those who dies have dissolved, but it's in a moment and in a twinkling of an eye. It's just going to be gone all of a sudden. And don't think that if you miss the rapture, you're going to be able to pick up my iPhone either. (laughs) No, for some reason it is laying around at that point. I suppose you can have it. (laughs) But don't be looking for an Apple Watch or my shoes laying on the ground or anything like that. Uh, we shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we, how long? Ever be with the Lord. And not just ever, but ever and ever and ever. Jesus called it eternal life. Eternal life. How long will it be? It will be forever. The Bible uses a phrase, this really interesting phrase in the book of Ephesians, and you can uh, read it in your own time. I think it's in Ephesians chapter 1, that in the ages to come, he might show his exceeding goodness to us. So what are we going to be doing? Well, one, we're going to be kings and priests. Kings, a, a good king works, doesn't he? And a priest works, doesn't he? We're going to rule and reign, and we have all of God's creation to rule and to reign over. And in the ages to come, in the time of eternity and eternity and forever, we're going to be working as, as, as kings and as priests Right next to God, nobody, nobody above us but God himself, and we're going to be learning. That's how good God is, that it's going to take eternity for us to continue to learn how good God is. You think this describes how good God is? As, as, without being a reverend, as great and as powerful as this, the salvation that God has imparted to us in this life is, God is so much greater than that that we can't even imagine it. God is a spirit, and we with our carnal minds are trying to understand an eternal God. The only grace that he's given us is you want some of me in the life to come? Will you take me by my word, by this, in this life? And now I've got something for you in the ages to come. This is nothing. This is just a dressing room. But in the ages to come, after we've been caught up to meet the Lord forever in the air, that's the real thing. And that's what I want to be a part of. And can you imagine as eternity has gone by... After eternity and time and time again, how little and insignificant this life will seem. Don't lose your soul. In verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. And I, and I think about the scripture often sometimes, you know, comforting one another with these words. We've got to, one, be bold enough to be able to say, brother or sister, it's okay. You can, you can deal with it. In the rapture, none of this is going to matter. You're hurting now, you're dealing with whatever back pain or whatever you're going through or situation on your job. Think about how temporal that is. But we should also be spiritual enough to receive that, amen? If the, if the, if the rapture's not on our minds and you're trying to labor and work for God, you are of all men most miserable. We got to get this thing on our minds, amen? In 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, and uh, yeah, we're almost done here. We'll go back to our focus verse in 19. I'm sorry for switching it up here. We're running out of time. So I was going to read the first two verses just to kind of give us context. But there, there, are some, there were some, Paul brings up the resurrection here uh, because there are some that are preaching that there was no resurrection of the dead. And I, and I ran into a man that tried to tell me that once, that heaven and hell were only places in your heart. But Paul is dealing with that exact sort of thing. He's saying, well, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then how can we preach that Jesus rose from the dead? And if Jesus didn't rise for the dead, well, then you're still in your sins. And your faith is in vain. And, and, we, and we're liars. None of this matters then if, if there's no resurrection of the dead. If heaven or hell is only a place in your heart, then you tell me where my Lord, my Savior, Jesus Christ, that most assuredly rose from the dead, you tell me where he ascended to far above all heavens and made atonement uh, on the mercy seat of God for us. You tell me where he did that if it was just a place in my heart. 
But Jesus, when he rose, he ascended far above all heavens. He presented himself as the lamb to, uh, to the high priest who was himself, turned around and sat on the throne up in heaven. And guess what? He's coming back again for me one day. That's what I believe according to this. And he says it that way in our, in our focus verse. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead. Now, what kind of risen from the dead is he? He's risen from the dead. Rome, the book of Romans says it like this. He liveth, he liveth, he was raised to die no more. In one place it says he ever liveth to make intercession for the saints. Jesus rose and will never die again. Just like the saints in the rapture will rise and never have to die again. Which is different than how Lazarus was raised from the dead. That was resurrection from the dead. They were brought again in their own carnal bodies that had to die again. But we get the resurrection of the dead, where we'll never have to die again, just like Jesus is never going to have to die again. But now Christ is risen from the dead, not of the dead, from the dead, and become the first fruits from them that slept. Now, what, what does first fruits mean? Well, you gotta under, we have to understand that the Bible is... Uh, during an agricultural time, when farmers would plant their field where they made their livelihood, they had a corner of a field that they might plant first, so that when harvest time comes, they had a spot that would bud first, and they'd be able to yield the crop from that first, which would be representative of the rest of the crop that they would get. Well, that first fruits that was representative of the rest of it, that's what Paul is saying Jesus is. Just like Jesus rose up with a glorified body that could uh, appear and disappear, that could make itself known or not make itself known, that was powerful enough. You think about this, the, the, how much time and effort goes into designing a NASA rocket that could get into space. You ask Elon Musk about that and the struggle that he deals with getting rockets up into space. But the body that Jesus had when he rose up, he, he rose up and ascended into heaven fast enough to where he could then come back later and appear unto many. Far above all heavens, faster than any spaceship has ever been. And guess what? He's the first fruits. So that body that he rose up with, that's the kind of body that we're going to have. Why? Because he's the first fruits. Uh, it says it like this. Um, they, uh, and I can't remember where it is. I think it's Philippians. Um, who shall change this vile body and fashion it like unto his glorious body. So the body that Jesus rose up with, that's the kind of body that the saints are going to have in the rapture. Why? Because Jesus is the first fruits. We'll skip to verse 35. But some men will say, now he starts to describe what that resurrection is going to be like to get, to get this straight. But some men will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? Thou fool. Now, Paul's not calling names. Some might think about the scripture where Jesus uh, talked about anybody that said uh, raka, which is to say thou fool will be in danger of the judgment. But that's not what Paul is doing here. He's not calling names. He's saying you're uneducated. If you don't understand the things of God in this matter, it's because you haven't been taught. You haven't been schooled in this. You are a fool or you're unlearned. That which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. Now, what in the world does that mean? Again, he's using a natural illustration of sowing or what we might call today simply planting. So you take a seed or a piece of corn or whatever it may be and you plant it in the ground. What's going to come up? Is it going to be a big corn kernel popping up out the ground? No. <laughs> it's going to be a corn stalk. But guess what? That, that seed had to die first. When that germ in the seed is germinated, that outside the, the, the seed itself has to split and die for that germinated seed to actually bud up and become something completely different. And that's what Paul is saying. This body that we die with, it has to die for something else to come up. In verse 37, And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain it may have chance of wheat or some other grain. If I plant a sunflower seed, you know, I'm not the biggest on sunflowers, y'all, okay? But if I plant a beautiful, whatever, flower seed, that flower seed looks completely different than the flower that comes up, doesn't it? And that seed itself has to first die. It's the same way in the resurrection. This body is going back to dust. God is not using anything of this body to give me the body that I'm going to get in the resurrection. This body is made out of the earth, but the body that I'm going to get in the resurrection, it's going to be made out of heavenly substances. 
in verse 20 in verse 38. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of man, another kind of beast, another of fish and another of birds. Um, skip down a verse to save time. Uh, verse 42. So also it is so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. He gives four differences here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 of what our old, this old body is like versus what our new body is going to be like. The first one is corruption. It's sown in corruption. It's sown with cancer. It's sown with gangrene. It's sown with COVID-19. But when it's raised up, there's no more corruption like that that's going to touch this body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. The people on your job might overlook you. Your friends that you once hung out with, they might overlook you and think nothing of you. Why? Because you're an unlearned, un uneducated Christian. But in the resurrection, they're going to be able to look at the glorified bride of Christ as being nothing higher than it other than God itself. Raised in glory. Sown in weakness and raised in power. Uh, you know, some of us like to, to work out and uh, put on a show and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, what we have then, we're going to be able to do a lot more with that than what we are now. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And we're just about done. If you skip to me, if you skip with me to verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed how fast? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That trumpet is not a literal, that's not what that's talking about. In Revelation, he said, I heard, as it were, behind me, a voice as of a trumpet, saying, come up hither. The trumpet is referring to the word of God, God speaking and calling his people up home. Skip down to verse number 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. If we don't focus on the rapture, then we might, be, we might start to feel as though our labor in, is in vain in God. But if we focus on what it is that God has promised us and being ready for that, then we have a reason to be steadfast. That's why he says, therefore. Therefore means for this reason. If I want to make it, be steadfast. You know how we fasten down tents at the campground so the wind doesn't blow it away? You put whatever spikes you need to put in your life so that nothing blows you away from your walk with God. Because if we want to make it and our labor to not be in vain, we need to be ready for the rapture. Amen? Amen. Let's stand on our feet.